Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 183 for Monday, September 24th, 2018. folks and welcome to gig gab the podcast by for and about working musicians here as usual in during durham new hampshire easy for me to say i'm dave hamilton and here in las gatas california it's paul kent how you doing today mr kent well dude i'm doing good but even better it's your birthday it is <laughs> yes it is happy birthday my brother thanks man i appreciate that yeah. You, yeah. you have much music in your life to celebrate your birthday this year? Uh, well, today we do this. Then I do another podcast that I do called Mac Geek Gab. And then I like race over to the Seacoast Rep uh, Theater to set up my drums and rehearse for Madhouse on Wednesday. So, yeah, I've got some music in the schedule today. That's cool. Yeah. What's your what's uh what's your favorite thing to do at shows when someone wants to celebrate a birthday? Do you sing happy birthday to them? Do you play something? Do you play the Beatles happy birthday? What is the Beatles what is happy the thing birthday is is not an easy uh song to pull off. Like that that I've found I've tried it I've, and have had, you know, varied success depending on the band. But um simply and, and it it often isn't what the vibe calls for when it's someone's birthday. Usually the best thing to do is in the key of F, sing the ha- sing happy birthday yeah. and and then that's it and you're good. Move on. And F yeah. seems to be a universally usable key for all the people that are going to be singing. So I would agree with that. The, the temptation is to go to C, which is not a very good key for happy birthday. Bad, bad for happy birthday. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah How yeah. about this? It's talking about birthdays. Um, when you do a fairly big gig and the first person comes up and says, hey, could you wish someone happy birthday? And then not long after another one. Do you try to group them together or does that not make it a special enough birthday wish for any one person or is it the best way to conduct the business? You know, what do you do when there's a lot, when you get a lot of requests for shout outs? Yeah, you, um, I, I, yeah, I, I think you got to play it by ear, right? It's the, um, you know, the second one. Sure. I mean, but you're not singing happy birthday every time, right? You know, uh, yep. but I guess when the second one comes up, the right thing to do is ask, all right, we have another birthday in the house. <laughs> Are there any more birthdays that we should know about between now and the end of the performance? Let us know now. Right. So there you go. That, I think that's how you do it. Right. You know what I like to do is, is I like to take birthday wishes and, and bundle them with a song and do it like a dedication. That seems to be very meaningful to people. Mm. And, you know, again, I, I don't open it up and let people request songs because that's going to get out of hand pretty quick. Sure. But, you know, if uh, if I could just say, hey, you know, this is to Joe from all your buddies over there, you know, happy birthday. And then a song is bundled with it. It's a little bit different than just than just singing happy birthday. You know, again, people will always like to be sung happy birthday to. I, and, like, and, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Bundling with a song, but not necessarily happy birthday. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. 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 And you can even couch it nicely and say, hey, look, you know, we found out it's Timmy's birthday. And since we already sang happy birthday, we don't want to have to do that again because we don't like to repeat songs. But we do have a special song that we'd like to send out to you, Timmy, on behalf of all your friends. And then you count in whatever the next song on the set list is. And that's how it goes. I, exactly. Yeah. Although I will say that... Uh, the song in our set list that I can bundle in any kind of a dedication and works and makes people happy is let's get it on by Marvin Gaye. There's so, I mean, I mean, you get a guy who's get us a dedication from his wife or his girlfriend. It works a girlfriend from a, you know, a husband or, or, a, or, a, or, a you know, a dude. I think uh, that song is always a appreciated dedication song. So let me, let me ruin that for you and everyone listening <laughs> now. <laughs> Because Marvin Gaye wrote that song about and in yeah, the studio yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sang yeah, yeah, yeah. it to his I know. 15-year-old girlfriend. You uh, had to go there. I Well, you know, it's what goes it, – it, I know this and I can't suffer alone. So now you all know that there is something wrong with him loving her. So there you go. All I know is when I say let's get it on and you and the Simon plays that wah wah, wah, wah. yeah yep I mean people lose their mind it is it is a 
classic that works if you can sing it and you know nick sings the heck out of it yep it really makes people happy it is a, it is I, a great I agree. bar band song it's a great it's a great formal event song it's a great wedding song it is it is a, truly a classic it's a great tune we actually threw it in the last time we played uh rocky horror there was a moment where there was uh, i think puppet sex happening on on the stage and so as a band we threw in uh, you know just the groove from let's get it on for uh, <laughs> 30 seconds or something yeah yeah, yeah. love it but yeah That's i mean cool. as soon as that guitar groove comes uh, that guitar intro comes in all right so now i'm going to take us in another direction paul uh speaking of guitar intros I spent some time over the last week and sorted something out. Uh, I have always, years ago, maybe 10 years ago, I figured out how to come in after the guitar intro of the Beatles Drive My Car. Mm -hmm. But when I played with you guys, uh, there was some uh, contention over how that was counted. And I, I didn't, it's one of those things where I learned how to do it, but I never figured out how to count it and as i started figuring out how to count it i realized whoa this is really hard like it's it's not hard when you just read the sheet music but hearing it and hearing yeah. the beats where they're supposed to be is crazy right because it starts just and we did this i don't know a couple of years ago with take it easy um it, it just like take it easy it starts on the end of four but the problem is that all the hits, well, there's 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 sort of three, there's four hits. Three of them are on upbeats. One of them is on a downbeat, right? So the um, starts on the end of four, and then it it it's in four. It's not a weird thing once you know it. But uh, I'll say it, and then I'm going to play it, and we can we can hear it together, right? Well, even right. better. How about this? We'll count it. I'll sing the guitar part, and you sing the jump part. Okay. All right. Fair. Okay. But yeah. All okay. Right. One and two. We'll do it a little slow. One and. two. Two and three and now, four. Now, now, nope. now, now. It's on the end of four. It's the one. guitar part starts in the end of four. Correct. One. It's one, two, three, four. Bow, no, 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 no. Right. And four okay. and right. And four and two and three, four and and two and three, four. Boom. Try it again. Zero. One, one and two and three and four. Now, 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 now. Yeah, not really. It's actually da 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 da. Yes, right. And for and one and right. That's right. And one and two and one and two and one and two and three. Right. Hold on a second. I'm gonna get a guitar. Hold on. All right. Pause. Yeah, man. Yeah, go get a guitar. I love it. Real time, folks. Here's how we do it. Yeah. Yeah, it's right. Three, four, and one, and two, and three, four, and and two, and three, four. Boom. Ask the girl what she wants. And I'm just filling time here. I'm going to play it. I have the uh, the Beatles version uh, ready to go here, but uh, but we'll see how we'll see how we do here in the uh, in the uh, Gig Gab Laboratory. As Paul returns with a uh, with a guitar that I'm sure we'll be able to hear. So, all right, me, you there? Yeah, yeah, we're here. Yeah, man, right, absolutely. Let me, get, let me okay. get the mic jiggered correctly here. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully, I won't do anything weird. I will warn you. I believe, at least as of two years ago, the house rockers were counting it drop by dropping an eighth note. I think. Well, I think the rhythm section played it the way it is. I think just you know, I don't think we dropped the. I don't think we dropped time. I just think where the drums came in. So. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. But, but let's sing when, when it comes in there. So do it again. Ask a girl what she Ah. wanted to be. Yeah. All right. Let me play the Beatles. And we'll and I'll count it along with them. Uh, I think I've I've got the, the the sound right here. Two and three, four and and two and three, four one and the girl right. So four and and two and three, four one. I am dropping an eighth. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. It, and three, four and and two and three, four one. Uh, you were drop. You're you're playing everything right. You're just hitting the one an eighth note early. So yeah, 
Right. It's M M1 and M1 and oh, dang, it's hard. <laughs> without the without the sheet music in front of me, it's really hard, right? M1 and 2 and 3 4 and M2 and 3 4 1. Ask the girl, right? <laughs> Yep, that's it. Here we go again, Mr. Harrison. And, <laughs> and two and three, four and and two and three, four one. That's a, right. There you go. It's crazy, it's, and that's where the, that's where it is. Yeah. Three, four, one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and the drum fills on that three, four, one, right? Three e and a four e and one. Ask a girl. Yep. So it's and, crazy. you know, same thing as same thing as Glory Days. Is that a is yes. that a happy mistake it's, or is that a is that a is that a produced intent? So it's so funny that you mentioned Glory Days because if we had had this conversation before the show, I would have said, whatever you do, don't mention Glory Days because that's the <laughs> that's the next one. I'm, I've I've figured it out before. I'm pretty sure. So I've I've read about the Glory Days thing, but I I don't have it in my head. Uh, exactly how it is. I think it starts on the end of one, but I might be wrong about that because it, I, in fact, I, I, I am almost certainly wrong about that. Uh, I think it starts on the downbeat, but it sounds like it's on the end of one, maybe. But I did read something. Wait, wait. So what you're saying is that, the, is that the guitar part is actually what's off what's off beat that then settles into straight time. Once the beat comes in, the drums are actually in straight time. So it, it's all in straight time. It's just where, where I, it is. I, it, well, what I'm saying is, is that the, the guitar is, the guitar is in an awkward place within the straight time in the intro and then settles into a, a more natural place. Once the band flows, it's not it, the drums. It that settles are changing. into it's a the, natural place. One beat before the drums come in. Right. Cause it's like, uh, one ant and three, four, one ant and three, right? When he drops yeah. into that one ant. And and just like Drive My Car, you can hear, I've learned just enough of the eighth notes before the drums have to come in to get it right every time. But to sit and tell anyone, including a guitar player, like, no, you start on the, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I <laughs> Shut up, man. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> like, uh, I rely on you to play your part right. And then I know how to my, play my part, but heaven forbid that's wrong. Then I'm, and I have no, I, I don't know where you're <laughs> supposed to be. Uh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. But I, but I did some, reading about that and um it was pretty i think it was one of the musicians in the or maybe the engineer on the session there who said that was very much intentionally done by bruce he wanted to create something that was like a little bit effed up and and you know caused that that shift to happen so yeah that so was that not feeling a of when the band kicks in that everything kind of melds together you know it's 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 this loose thing that then becomes tight yeah yeah, he is on the on the one. Yeah, he starts on the one. I, I and then think it turns I'm into crystallizing that, it in my head. And then it, and when the band kicks in, the, the guitar is actually kind of like this faux rocked up reggae thing. Yeah, when right? the band kicks da, in. Da, 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 da. Yeah, but when the band kicks in, like the hit, the the pulse, I should say, from the guitar from the rhythm section is on the ends, uh, on the end of one, right? It's uh, uh, no, no, uh, uh, no, no. the guitar might be, I don't know the, I haven't broken it down all the way. Guitar might be playing that one and, and three, four, one and, and three, four, right? But like he's doing in the intro. So that's, yes, exactly. Do that again, because you did you did four of them. I was expecting you to do two, but I think so, yeah. Go ahead. So here's the intro. Yeah. I don't think that's right. I I I don't think that's turning it around at the right time, and I don't have it queued up here. So we got to dig into that one. We got to come back to that. Because I I can't uh, it's I, I don't have it. It's uh, it, goes, it goes from and then uh, when it breaks in it, it's yes sorry. that's correct it, yes yeah and then, 
And when the band kicks in, it's... It's... Yeah, 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 yeah. So you may have it right. You may have it right. It's a Bruce song. I've got it right. Uh, yes, I, I would have it. I would expect nothing less. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I was just counting measures. Uh, I, I think on the studio version, he just does two measures by himself and then the drums kick in. Right. 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 So no, 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 no. The drums are right in with him from the beginning in that strange place. Oh, really? I, I mean, I believe you. I, I always thought that the guitar started it for two bars and then it changed. And the, the kick drum came in on the one of that third measure. That's how I've learned it. But it but mm. there might be live versions or something where it's different. No, no, no. I'm talking straight up. It's always he always plays it the same. I mean, even okay. live it has that weird lineup. But um, I don't know, man. Let's listen to it. Yeah. All right. You know what? Hang on. Let me see if I've got a uh, I've got a copy. I'm going to pause the show here. This is Im- this is important stuff, folks. All right, I think. And we're I back. think it's the guitar starts on the on the up of four, right? Uh, One, two, two I, three, four. Bomp, ba, da, da. Now I think it's on the on downbeat. One. I really do. But let's let's listen. Let me see if I got this right here. So here we go. One, two, three, four. Oh, no, you're right. Yeah, up of four. Uh, four no, it'd, and. Be the, it'd be the end of one. And of four. The end of one, because I was an eighth note early. Okay. I think, I think, let's try it again. Let's try it again. And four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four. Yeah. It's on the So end the drums, that's what I'm saying. The drums are actually right on two and four right from the beginning. Well, it's the guitar that shifts. Everybody thinks it's the drums. Correct. The, no, the drums are, the, but the weird part is the first measure and the second measure of that the guitar players are not the same. And that's the distracting part, right? Because if we start him on the and of one, which we just proved was right, right? Listen to this. Yeah. Oh, shoot. I missed my count. Boom. All right. Let me try one last time. I got it right the first time. I should have quit while I was ahead. <laughs> three and four and three one and four and, and one and two and, and three. And and three. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. This but actually you can't. You, but here's the funny thing. You can't do that in a nutshell, right? Because the question is, if it's 4-4 four, four time, it is. the question is how it kicks in the band, right? So how do you know if it's the guitar starting in the wrong place or if it's the drums that are in the different well, place? Well, I'm, I'm just assuming the guitar is playing a measure of of four and just not coming in on, on the one, right? The guitar is coming in on the end of one of that first measure, Right. And but and you can't tell until the band kicks in at the end with where you've because there's, there's no count into it. So my point is, how do you know if it's not the guitar on one and the and the drums slightly, you know, on an and you don't know? Well, because, because if, if the band kicks in at the end, is it dot dot bump? Bom, or is it dot 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 bump bump bump? I'll play it because the band follows. I mean, they all follow the same four. The drummer's just playing two and four, one one and three on the snare, two and or one and three on the kick, two and four on the snare, and then that doesn't change, right? I don't think so. Let's let's hear it again. Three and four and one and two and three four one and two and three four one and two and three four one two three. Yeah, you're right. Four. Yeah. So they're all playing the same meter. It's just like, yeah, the guitar starts on the end of one, but the weird part is that second bar is not the same as the first, I don't think. One more time, just for good measure. One and two and three and four. One and two. Yeah. So the, yeah, second, da, 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 right, da, da. the second measure, he's playing one and, and also playing one and on the third measure. But it doesn't yep. sound like that because you think he came in on the, yeah, it's, yep. Crazy, man. All right, well, we solved this other thing, which I didn't think we were going <laughs> to solve today. So this has been... This has been my brain. And I blame Carl Allen. Uh, he's a drummer. I went and saw him a week. Wait, we're not. Are we recording now? We've been recording since you came back. Yeah. Oh, I thought you paused it so we I, to go and get. Uh, I paused it glory to get days. glory days. And then I and then I once we had it, I just there we go. I, I just recorded. You're a genius bad? engineer. I, I don't know. know. Yeah, Fine. there we go. So I do. I blame Carl Allen. I went and saw on September 10th. So two weeks ago today. I saw this thing at the University of New Hampshire, which is, you know, right around the corner from us here in Durham. Uh, They have this traditional jazz series. And I've been to a couple of them over the years. They've been doing them for 40 years. So I certainly have missed plenty. Uh, But they had their their first show of the season was 
uh, put on by this this drummer Carl Allen, who puts on a, a who put together a show that he calls the Art of Elvin. And it celebrates the music of Art Blakey and Elvin Jones, two fantastic, seminal, you know, uh, groundbreaking jazz drummers. And certainly they played some tunes that Art played. They played some tunes that Elvin played and, and wrote in his band and all that. But, but but they also played some tunes that those guys didn't play. And really, the the point was to kind of put on a band like those guys would have done, um, paying tribute to them that way. And so, you know, the first tune, yeah, you know, they, they, there were five of them on stage, right? There was a, a piano, bass, drums, and then a sax player and a trumpet player. The trumpet player turns out to be uh, the brother of Carl Allen, the drummer. But man, like this drummer picked up, uh, they came out on stage and they're, you know, taking their seats or whatever. The drummer looks around and he says, all right, you know, and he just pulls out a set of brushes and starts playing this groove, man. And it's just a mid-tempo swing groove. Like there was nothing like it wasn't speed demon impressive or technique wise, like didn't have any flashy thing. The first beat and a half, man, like the the feel that this guy had with brushes was like, oh, holy crap. I, I mean, he was it was so good. It sent shivers up and down my spine. And my my daughter, who goes to UNH now, uh, she joined me and came with me, which was nice. We had like kind of a you know daddy daughter uh, night out, um, and and she said the same thing. She's like, "That's freaking amazing!" Like we could have left after that first beat and a half, mm -hmm. and we would have been fine. And uh, and 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 yet there was much more to come. <laughs> and y you know, all of these guys were such excellent and and, and well, to, to return to that briefly brush feel is one of those things that's definitely developed and mostly unique to any given player right you, you know the, the, it's just the way you hold them and the way you learn and and you can really I, identify players that way and uh and this guy's feel like i mean it just it oozed decades <laughs> of excellence right it was just crazy and then the whole band, like, you know, you have those nights where everything you do, just like your hands do the things that you ask them to do and, and, and things are good and, and you're just comfortable and you're like, wow, this is Nirvana here. That's where these guys start every gig, at least this yeah. gig. And my guess is it's where they start every gig. And, for, and they never got to the point where they were like intentionally showing off for the crowd, but they were intentionally showing off for each other. Mm -hmm. And there was a real lesson in that. Like, you know, there, it, it wasn't this thing where it was like, ah, oh, let me show you what I'm going to do. It was more like, I'm going to do a thing that's meant to mess with you. Like, <laughs> like one of the other musicians and it's your job to hold it together. Like there was one point, the piano player, this guy, Oh, I don't have his name right in front of me. Bruce, uh, something or other. It's fantastic. I'll get his name. I'll put it in the show notes. Uh, at giggabpodcast.com. The piano player was by, f not, not by far, but but certainly made the impression on me as the, the best player on stage. But we're talking degrees of excellence here. Like any one of these guys was was the best player, arguably, right? And they never, I never saw any of them play a bad note that I could tell. Um, and they certainly didn't appear to be playing it safe. Quite the contrary. Like this drummer took a solo at one point and, uh, you know, in, in traditional jazz, the way it works is when the drummer takes a solo, for those of you that, that haven't dug into it, uh, he plays, he or she plays the form of the song. And then the band comes back in after he plays all the way through, you know, if it's two A section, one B section, back to an A section, whatever it is. That the whole form, 32 bar form, whatever it is, 48 bar form, and then boom, the band comes in on the one. And uh, and so the band has to count all the way through. Now, in theory, the drummer might be playing some things that that imply where, you know, he's feeling the form or whatever. And that certainly happened in, in most of the songs, but there was definitely one or two where, you know, they had gotten comfortable on stage. They were having some fun with each other. And Carl, in the last, like, you know, eight measures starts playing this thing where he's doing, you know, what, what I like to call metric modulation, where he starts playing different times, time feels over this underlying pulse of a time signature that may not be stated, you, you know, like he's not keeping two and four on the hi-hat anymore, but he's keeping time in his head. 
and you know, I, as he did it, I heard the piano player go, Oh, like, you know, like, Oh crap, you know, he's doing it to me. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, man, they all came in on that one. And the drummer was like, Oh, dang it. And then they were trading fours later in the night and he was still trying to mess him up. Finally got him. Um, but you know, like this was, this was an effort and it was fun to watch because here are these, you know, these five musicians on stage that are just having a blast, like yeah, playing sparring. with each other, sparring. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, it did in a, <laughs> in a different sense, uh, but equally as fun. And I think equally as per perceptible to the crowd. The first time we played with the Macworld all-star band at Broadway studios, um, there was something magical about that night. And and we all were playing our best to best the other. Right. Like, you know, somebody would play a tune, sing a tune or play a tune or whatever. It was like, all right, well, the, the bar has been reset now. I got to play over that bar. And we were just constantly raising our collective game by, you know, competing with each other. But I think sparring is a better, better word for it. It wasn't it never felt competitive it was all right let's see can you know let's have some fun with let's it let's have yeah. some fun with it yeah exactly and and that's what these guys are doing but the thing is these guys do this every night that they play and man it was just like i said to my daughter as we were leaving i'm like well it's a good thing they weren't just a little bit better because otherwise i'd have to go home and turn my drums into coffee <laughs> 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 but it was it was a pleasure it's always such a pleasure watching people that are, well, that are masters, masters of their craft. Yeah. 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 And literally there, it is, it is coming from within it, you know, it, it, the, all the wood shedding and all the learning, you know, it gets all melded into who you are as a musician. And then when you get to that point where you're just able to emote out whatever musical feeling or sense you have total control of your instrument and your craft, it's, it's a pretty cool thing in, cool. in anything in life. Drumming is kind of magical that way that though, you know, I, you know, every instrument has wizardry and, and technical proficiency and artistry and that type of thing. There's something about drumming that is uniquely, I think, magical, you know, maybe because you have four limbs going in different directions or, you know, whatever it may be, but there, to see a drummer, like, you know, Buddy Rich would be the one that I would yeah. think of. Right. You yeah. know, this is a guy who like, in his eyes, you see one human being, but in his artistry and what he does, you, you, you are given a, a different person, essentially. Yeah. It's a pretty amazing thing. It's pretty the drums, amazing. Yeah. Drums are remarkable. I, you know, I was thinking the other day about um, why does, I was going to ask you, why do, why do so many cover bands when they play rock and roll, just, we're sticking with drummers, but we're kind of changing the conversation yeah. here. Why does rock and roll feel stiff often? They're playing on the beat. Time is fine. But there's nothing to dance to, you know, the, you know, the, the, the audience can't quite find it. You know, it's technically correct. Yes. It's not, you know, it's, it's the, it's the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law type of thing. You got to have that balance, man. I mean, it, it, you got to have that groove is what it is. I, I learned this um, from, well, I mean, from a lot of people over the years, but I played, I had the pleasure of playing with a guy named Jimmy Ward for a bass player named Jimmy Ward for a number of years. We played in a band called Route 66 together when I lived in Connecticut uh, up until 13 years ago. And Jimmy uh, was the bass player in the 80s hair metal band Steelheart. And they, I mean, you, you've, you've probably heard of these guys, right? They had that huge hit, Angel Eyes, you know, Angel Eyes, or I'll never let yeah. you go. Yeah, right. And he, co he actually co-wrote co that tune. Uh, in fact, he would be a good person to get on the show here. Uh, but, um, but, Play, and we were just playing, like you said, straight up covers, Beatles, Stones, you know, whatever, Elvis Costello, Tom Petty, you know, it was just, just cover band. And we were a good cover band, but we were a cover band. And um, he really taught me how to feel that eighth note in a way that pulsed. And, and a large part of it was... Uh, just playing with him, but we had a couple of conversations about it. He's like, and, 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 you know, they started with his frustration of no man, like you gotta, like you gotta feel it. And it really has to kind of rock back and forth uh, between the, the one on the kick and the two on the snare and you know, three mm. on the kick, four on the snare. And it needs to feel like this thing. And there's that whole conversation we've had a few times on the show about beat placement and all of that. And that's definitely part of it. But it's one of the it's it's that classic thing where you have to learn it and then forget it so that you can do it. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just and some guys 
can just do it, you know, really, really well right out of the gate. Um, yeah, I feel like I don't I don't know. I didn't I wasn't there the first time John Bonham sat down and, you know, played the drums. But he certainly had that uh, in a huge way. Like you can you can taste it when you when you hear him play like it's just, you know, it's just and it's that loping well, thing. Bonham, Charlie, Ringo. I mean, they yep. all have. There's a there's a unique groove that comes out of them. And, and what I find often with a lot of cover bands, again, they're playing technically in time, but nobody's moving. You can't find something, you know, the dancers can't. And you go to a rock concert. And even if you don't think of it as, you know, dance music, everybody, your body just moves when the yeah. pocket is there. Right. And the groove it's is not, there. It's not just the drummer. It's the bass player, too. Yeah, it really is like the two not only need to lock in, but need to play the right level of busy to uh, or no more than the right level of busy. Right. You can always play less like that's never going to be a problem, I don't think. But but there is and every band has a different level of busy that works. And every drummer and bass player combo has a different level of busy that works for each person. And they really if you have a busy drummer, you know, and you want to have people grooving and dancing, uh, you probably shouldn't have a busy bass player and vice versa. Right. Although, well, Rush, most people don't dance to. So maybe that that's that proves the rule. Uh, yeah, but if you go to a Rush concert, you do people see, I find know. people swaying, you know, to it's to the true. emotion of the music. And no, I actually say to the pocket that's there. It's, it's it, it is truly a thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So but it it is that like it's not just the drummer, although a drummer should like you should be able to have a drummer just play a groove and you can like not, it, it's not even that you can move to it. It's that your body wants to move to it. Right. Richie Hayward was that guy. Oh my God. Was he got that guy? Right. You couldn't sit or even stand still. If that, that guy was playing with little feet, right. like just impossible. Even if I, was, I was thinking yeah. about this week, this weekend, I was at a wedding and uh, the couple that got married, I think they were 30 and the DJ was playing some music and I was, you know, he was playing a lot more kind of like hip hop and rap sure. stuff. But I, it, it, it was interesting to me to watch as a musician, like, when a groove started, observe what people do. They kind of make the stank face. They kind of like, you know, yeah. when it's a song, they kind of get into it. And then, you know, just watch people sway. That's really what we're supposed to be doing as musicians, right? You know, th this is, again, the, the, the letter of the law versus the spirit of the law. You can play the right notes. The quest for a cover musician is to, is to find the mojo that made it a song you'd want to cover in the first place. That's and it. a lot of that comes from the pocket. But when music done right, you watch it take over people, literally. I mean, I'm sitting with a bunch of older people at this table and some, you know, well-known rap song comes on and you actually see the head starting to bob and, and that type of thing. That's that's good music, man. That's yeah. that's what you're going for is the yeah. stuff that just takes people over regardless of genre. And that's what you, I often and, and the thing is, you know, rock and roll is important to me when that doesn't happen with rock and roll. It feels like you're not serving the song, you know, when yeah. someone when someone squares off the edges of a, of a Beatles tune or, or a Stones tune and you can't get people to dance to brown sugar, you know, how dare you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're, you're doing it wrong, man. You're just doing it wrong. How dare you? Ah, it's <laughs> awesome. It's true, though. Right. It, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And that's not it. Like the Stones are a, their grooves. You can play Stones songs. The good news is you can play a Stones song, not the way the, the Stones played that groove. And it, they still work like they're well-written riffs. Um, and I don't know that they're the best crafted songs in the world, but, but I guess it depends on your definition of best crafted song because they just work. And you can play Honky Tonk Woman totally the wrong way and fill a dance floor as long yep. as you just keep a, you know, keep a pulse happening. But to play a groove the way Charlie played it, man, like it's there's it, magic in it. It's yeah. Just and, magic. and I've had I've actually had this this conversation uh, with well, I was having it with another drummer. There was uh, there was a, there's a theater show called In the Heights, right? Uh, that was the first show that Lin Manuel Miranda did before he did Hamilton, and it's a mm -hmm. great show. Uh, I saw it and had the pleasure of seeing it in London, and then uh, they did a, a local production of it here. And they said the uh, they brought in a music director that had been on tour with Hamilton to you know to to craft this thing and pull it in. And the drummer was saying, his friend of mine, he was like, yeah, you know, this guy's really strict about making sure you play like these. There's a lot of Latin groove stuff, stuff, right, um, that that happened in this tune or in this in this uh, play, a few, uh, production. 
And uh, and he was like, no, you're not playing like the the you know, the the Tom hit and the snare hit at exactly the right point. And I was like, yeah, man, like uh, so first of all, no, thanks. I don't want to take a sub gig on this for that Saturday that you asked me about. But, uh, <laughs> you know, like you can't you you have to when you're playing a groove, it's really hard to play a groove technically exactly as another drummer played it and well, make you have it different hands and you, you have, have different, different exactly you have, different. you have a physically or a different human not not to mention it it's a different drum kit right and and so i whenever i do shows you know and i'm a groove guy right i mean you played with me enough to mm-hmm. to know that like i think about the groove and then it's like okay how can i embody that groove and i don't know that i could ever really write down like for someone else, what that groove is, but it's like, I need to go inside it and figure out how I can play it and support it so that it feels like it did when that guy played it. Not necessarily sounds exactly the same. Like sometimes what I'll do is I'll get a feel for it. And then if I have time, I can go back and say, okay, now I want to challenge myself. I want to play exactly the notes that that guy played and make it feel like it's supposed to feel now that I already know how to make it feel. You know what I mean? Like, that's- yeah, well, so to bring the conversation all the way around, yeah. the perfect example of this is Glory Days. It's a mid tempo <laughs> song. Yep. It's not, you know, again, it can turn, if you go too slow, it's a dirge. If you go to it fast, it, you know, I guess you, I guess you can err on the side of fast on that one a little bit, but done right. And, you know, Bruce plays it pretty much at that tempo and everybody in that place is moving, swaying, pumping their fists. I mean, they are into that groove, that magic, that pocket. And but it is a particularly um, delicate song for a cover band to handle well, just for that very reason. It's not fast. Uh, It's, you know, not obviously not a slow song. It, It is it is a tempo that's unique. And the only way it comes alive is if bass and drums are just driving the just shit out of it. Dr- you got to. It, you just got to drive the bus. Yeah. What was it? I think it was James Brown. Someone attributed this to James Brown. I don't know if that's true, but it, we might as well. That groove, the definition of groove is the slowest that you can play a tune and still make it feel good. Mm. And I don't know if, if James said that or not, but it's like that's it's a good thing to think about. Like getting Glory Days is a great. You know, it, although that could be too, right? Well, that's the definition of it, right? It's It's got to be at that right tempo. Too fast and you lose the pocket. Too slow and you lose the pocket. You yep. know, yep. So, so I had, um, I had a theater rehearsal uh, a week ago, just before we did the last show, the last episode. And um, I, it was, it was the, the most unprepared that I felt going into one of these rehearsals. And it wasn't that I didn't, I spent the same amount of time that I have on any other, but there was no recording of, it's a show called If Then that I'm doing, I think we open next week at uh, the University of New Hampshire. Same same stage that I saw the Carl Allen on. And uh, there was there was no recording that I could play along with in order to, again, feel these grooves. And they aren't simple tunes. They're, they're written by these two guys that wrote um, a musical called Next to Normal. I think I might've talked about that years ago uh, when I first did that one. Really intricate, tricky. It's 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 a rock musical, but these are tricky rock tunes and there's some Latin stuff in it and, and just some weird grooves and weird time signatures. There's one tune that vacillates between seven, four and four, four, seven, eight and four, four, you know, it drops an eighth note in a weird way and it's funky and it's supposed to groove and all that. And I did not, I couldn't play along with a record because the cast recording didn't match the score at all. Um, so I felt really nervous going into this rehearsal and but I had gone through the book and I was like, okay, okay, okay. And I, and I was like, still like, this is not going to go well. You know, I'm telling mm-hmm. myself like, okay, well, you know, I got to have one kind of sucks to that. It's this one because there's now eight people in the room while we're playing this and I'm going to go lay a big, big egg. And, uh, I don't know, maybe I had had just the right amount of caffeine or maybe I prepared more than I needed to or whatever, but man, I had this the, the the entire rehearsal was this extended moment of me looking at pretty pictures on the page and being aware of my body playing exactly mm. the right parts the whole time, including at one point 
the, the music director stopped at the band. He's like, okay, this is weird. He's like, I'm hearing you and the bass player playing something that doesn't match what's going on with like keyboard and trumpet and, you know, everything else that's happening. He's like, Dave, just you play your part. And it's this groove, but it was a weird groove. And I hadn't rehearsed them. for whatever reason I had overlooked this page. Right. So this was pretty much the first time that I was paying any attention to this page. And uh, I was like, okay. And I just started playing. And sure enough, I played exactly the right thing. The bass player locked right in with me. So I knew I was playing the right thing, you know, because he was reading from his book too. And and it was just these weird syncopated accents or whatever that when we dissected it fit really well, like in a weird way with what the piano was doing and what the trumpet was doing and all that. But it was a very, it was this moment where I was like, whoa, I got really lucky today. You know, like thankfully, whatever the gods, the stars aligned, I was good. And I thought, well, that was great. Here's my problem. I am now, I now know that that is possible. So how much am I going to rely on that happening the next time that I have one of these rehearsals? <laughs> like mm. that's the big danger moment for me. It was like, don't get too cocky kid. You're not that good. You just fooled yourself and them that day. Don't expect <laughs> it to happen again. <laughs> Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. I mean, it was, it's good that, you know, my sight reading was, is, was that good. I, it is not that good though. It was just, it was one of those moments. Like I said, you know, you have those times where everything goes right, but for me, that is not every time. Um, but thankful, you. thankfully it was that time. So, you know, now, cool. now we'll see how the first rehearsal goes. I think that's a week from tonight. Will I look at the piece between now and then realistically? No, I got Madhouse mm -hmm. on Wednesday. I got, uh, you know, a, a uh, gig with Fling on Sunday. Uh, no, I got a rehearsal for another musical on Saturday. This Brecktones thing that I'm doing with Billy Butler. So, which should be fun that he's a, he's a rock and roll local uh, musician, playwright, con composer, uh, great keyboard player, also a great guitar player. And you seem to have a lot of those eclectic, multi-talented, multi-disciplined people in your area. I don't, I don't know as many around here. I'm trying to think of anybody, but Amanda's that way, right? She's an actress and she's a, yeah. right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Arts I, people. I have the, well, and, and really it's the theater that opened me up to these people and connected me with these people. I don't know that I ever would have met Billy if, uh, if it weren't for doing, in fact, doing next to normal, which I just talked about, you know, I did that whatever, four years ago or whatever. I but. guess around here, you, did I ever tell you about my friend's band, the Peelers that are around here? Did uh -uh. I ever mention them? No. Um, so, uh, the, one of the, their, the essence of them, I believe is came out of being, um, participants and later directors and, and in the local children's musical theater, we have a really vibrant ch children's musical theater in San Jose. Um, and Ian, my buddy, um, is one of their lead singers and one of their founders. And, um, I guess, and, and then they have a couple other people that have come through that system. So I guess that makes sense that, you know, here are these people who are singing and, and dancing anyway. Um, and then they love popular music. And so what, what would you do between shows is you, you go rock out. You go rock out. Yeah. Well, for some people, I mean, not everybody's into right. the rocking out, but, but yeah, for the people that are, then that's what you do. I yeah. I'm it. looking forward to this, this Brecktones thing. Billy is the one who I did a uh, bitter pill with two years ago. He wrote all the music and, uh, and then the mad men who do madhouse did all the like puppets and, and they choreographed it and sort of wrote the show together and all this stuff. And, um, and this, this should be, um, it's a, it's a, obviously a different show. It's about, um, it's interesting. It's about a musician playing the last gig of his life in some dive bar somewhere, but there's also like poetry readings. Happen. I don't quite know the story of the show. Uh, you have to, I'll learn it. Trust me. Uh, but I'll, by the end of the run, I will, I will un understand it. Very and there's, cool. there's poetry readings or something. And his daughter, like long lost daughter winds up being someone that does a poetry reading. And, and so Billy's written a bunch of tunes for this, but um, there's also an improv element every night because we're going to ask uh, members of the audience can sign up, uh, you know, either as they arrive or ahead of time to read their own poetry. And then we, as the band will back them up. Uh, through this, you know, kind of poetry reading thing. So that should keep it interesting. Keep it that definitely sounds interesting. Yeah. I have a gig coming up on Saturday night that I'm really excited about. So I've mentioned it a few times over the past few weeks, but I'm, I did, you know, I've done my Springsteen tributes the last couple of years. I've done a couple of petty tributes and I just find these be very 
fulfilling creative outlets. And so I've been encouraging Steve and Mary Ellen, who I'm in Acoustic Madness with, yeah. that they because they, they've they participated in them and they've been great encouragers and supporters. Steve did one for Fogarty last year that or, the, or excuse me, earlier this year. That was a fantastic success. And, and we've been kind of holding off. Mary Ellen wanted to wait until the time was right. And, you know, again, I talk about Mary Ellen all the time. She's just the most remarkably talented vocalist that I've certainly played with. She's just fantastic. Her idol is Linda Ronstadt. And so she has put together this dream show of a tribute to Linda Ronstadt. It's called Hasten Down the Wind. It's going to be Saturday night. She already sold it out, which I knew she would. Nice. And and uh, she's assembled kind of handpicked musicians that she's known through the years. I'm fortunate enough to be one of the guitar players in it. We've had Three rehearsals, um, plus a walkthrough, plus, a, you know, when we started all this, we just kind of sat around a table and listened and kind of took some notes and, you know, kind of talked about it. Her husband, Tom, has been the musical director. He's fantastic. She is agonized, laboriously agonized over his set list decisions and, you know, really attention to detail. Wonderful. I'm really humbled. I mean, the, the players in this are fantastic. The musicians are wonderful, but ultimately, at the end of the day, not only is, is Mary Ellen fantastic, but the two women friends of hers who she's asked to come on and sing backgrounds to her are are as good as Mary Ellen. One, and there's just going to be show stopping moments, and so I'm excited about it. The show's this Saturday, sold out, but it's going to be Facebook Live broadcast. So once it's sold out, and she was continuing to get people who wanted to see the show, and you know. Maybe she could book another one somewhere down the line. I, I don't know what her plans are, but um, one way to satisfy the demand of other people who wanted to see and hear the show, she's going to Facebook Live it, and then she's teamed up that she's going to do. Um, this is going to be like a donate now button on the Facebook Live stream if you want to donate to Parkinson's uh, research, and oh, so nice. that's a cause that's interesting to her. So I'm just so proud of her because a this is a show that she's been wanting to emote. You know, her she, these are songs she says she's been singing, you know, since high school. So watching her go she just is disappearing and we're talking about a you know a, a musician that plays 100 to 200 gigs a year and has for the last 30 years she is disappearing in this music and is so Im incredibly powerful and then the band is wonderful the singing is wonderful i'm loving watching the way that she's approaching the organization of it and then really i knew she would sell it out because she's such she's so popular in this area but now taking this next step and it's you know like you and i are always looking at ways to kind of innovate the cover band process, right? We talk about it. We dream about it. We do interesting things. You know, we find interesting ways. She's iterating on it again by saying, okay, I'm doing this special thing. Um, tickets are on sale. Tickets are gone. If you still want to see it, let's do some good in the world. And so she's, you know, kind of awesome. further refining this idea of how do you take this skill of music, this, this often not very high paying skill of music. And how do you do something that a gets, gets you paid, does good, feels good. You know, it just kind of checks all the boxes for a creative outlet. If you're going to be a cover musician. That's freaking awesome, man. Yeah, wow. That's cool. I'll give you the link. I'll give you the link this week and okay. and we'll get it up. And uh, hopefully some people out there will want to listen to it. It's yeah. really in, in my area, the San Jose, South Bay, South San Francisco Bay area. It's really some of the best players in town that are, that are contributing to this. I'm one of three guitar players that are in it. You know, Joe is the drummer. He's and he's amazingly amazing in this stuff. Tom, her husband is a bass player. Um, there actually, there's a couple bass players who are rotating in. Tom does most of it. And he's a, but there's, um, Steve French from my black Sunday roadshow band is the pedal player. And you know, that pedal, that sound of pedal steel is just so different from things that we hear yep. in cover music, right? There's just yeah. so few of them out there. Yeah, and he's true. great. Yeah. Uh, we have Mark Fenichel is, is playing harp. Um, there's a there's a fiddle player um, and then there's a really world class keyboardist that that uh, Mary Ellen and Tom have met kind of through their journeys, uh, Glenn Woodward. So um, I'd love it if people listen to it. and I'd love to get some feedback from the show. It's going to be Saturday night. Uh, downbeats about eight o'clock California time. Um, I don't know. Facebook Live. Does it also get archives once you Facebook Live? It can people you, go you back can. later. And it's up to it's up to the person who published it if they want to, you know, let it be Got a it. thing but just in case it's something that's not that good yeah i mean not not that this would be but that's why facebook allows you know you, you get to pick so hopefully uh the you know the recording quality or the, uh, the audio and video quality is good and she'll want to no, it's gonna be a three camera shoot it's gonna be oh, a serious nice. thing i think they're gonna take board sound and so i think it's, it's oh, gonna then, be good yeah that that you're hedging your bets in the right direction there <laughs> yeah for sure so you know and one thing i want to get talk about we didn't get to it today but you know this thing you and i 
you and I do this, right? You and I think about the the task of being a musician and what are interesting things to do with with doing what we love. You know, I I like putting on those tribute shows. I like having a solo outlet, a, a duo outlet, a trio outlet, and then my band, you know, is my main outlet. And finding interesting in different ways and producing my own shows. You and I think like this, you know, maybe because we are entrepreneurial, you know, in our in sure. our lives. But I get it that a lot of people listen and are like, listen, I'm a musician. I just, I, just you know, I want to get a good, I want to so go, let's I want to go to the gig for next week, man. I yeah, like it. Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. And you folks send in your stuff to us, right? If, if you have some thoughts, you've certainly heard us talk about this, but if you had thoughts either, Hey, you know, I've done some cool things or I haven't, but I want to, or I haven't, and I'm happy doing this and, and here's why, like it's all good. And we'd love to share them feedback at giggabpodcast.com. That's where we want to hear from you. It's great to be able to do this as, as we do. So fun show, Dave. Happy fun. birthday, my brother. Thanks, I hope man. you have a great one. I appreciate that. Get that music going. Keep the beat on. Uh, that's, that's what I do. That's oh, and Dave, Dave, yeah, I forgot. Yeah. Oh yeah. Always be performing. My oh, brother. that's what it is. Thanks folks. Thanks Paul. See ya. See ya.